Warning. Hot phosphoric acid and its derivatives are incredibly dangerous and can cause serious chemical burns. Use gloves and other protective equipment when handling them. This experiment must be done with adequate ventilation or outside. In a previous video, I extracted phosphoric acid from an old rust remover. It was contaminated with what appeared to be some chromium-3 salts, so I attempted to distill to get a higher concentration of the acid. In the end, I only collected 47 milliliters of a cloudy 6.77% acid, which is a pretty pitiful yield. I saved the green solution left in the distilling flask from the last run, and I let it evaporate down some. Testing with acid-specific pH paper, the green solution is actually more acidic than the paper can measure. This means there's still plenty of phosphoric acid left to be extracted. In fact, the acid actually isolated was less acidic, judging by the color of the paper, than the remaining green solution. So, I decided to attempt this project over again. I combined the extracted phosphoric acid with the green solution so I could get a maximum yield from the original rust remover. Before going into the distillation, I want to discuss some of the issues with my previous attempt. As mentioned in the video where I made glass boiling chips, Teflon reacts with hot phosphoric acid. This, along with the calcium carbonate boiling stones I used, may have contributed to the large amount of foaming seen in the last video, which affected my yields. So, I would need to use a more unreactive material to prevent bumping. Glass boiling chips fit this category very well, and I will be using them here. Also, the boiling point of phosphoric acid is 158 degrees Celsius, which is a pretty significant temperature to retain throughout the first bits of glassware in a distillation apparatus. Once the temperature exceeds 215C, which I allowed it to in my first run, the phosphoric acid can decompose or polymerize. At high temperatures in nearly anhydrous conditions, the phosphoric acid dehydrates to form pyrophosphoric acid. This pyrophosphoric acid can then polymerize to form polyphosphoric acids and anhydrides of different chain lengths and cyclic structures. The three categories exist in equilibrium at high temperatures. The second two compounds are characteristically thick and incredibly viscous compounds that are typically solids at room temperature. As you will see later in this video, I had a major issue with these during this run. As a bit of an aside, pyrophosphates that are derived from pyrophosphoric acid are sometimes found in whitening toothpastes. I only discovered this through looking at my toothpaste bottle in the morning. Because pyro and polyphosphoric acids form at higher temperatures, Distillation of phosphoric acid is incredibly difficult. Yields are expected to be very low at best. In the case of chromium contaminants of phosphoric acid, which I'm dealing with, chemists tend to avoid distillation entirely. Several papers and patents have been produced successfully separating the chromium compounds from the acid using specific chelating resins or adherents. In other cases, chemists use ion exchange resins or specialized magnets. I've included links to these papers and patents in the description if you're interested. Regardless, these techniques are out of the scope of most amateurs. However, I did manage to obtain some significantly more concentrated phosphoric acid from my first run, even though it was plagued with missteps and bad turns. This video does not pose a practical solution for amateur chemists who wish to purify phosphoric acid from chromium compounds. It would be far easier just to buy some phosphoric acids free of impurities from a hardware or gardening store. Alright, so that's enough of my long-winded theory and background, and now let's jump into the extraction. I added some glass boiling chips made in my last video to the distilling flask to prevent bumping. Then, I poured in the contaminated phosphoric acid solution. This was allowed to evaporate down some in open air for a while, so hopefully the foaming should be more manageable than last time. Again, I set up for a simple distillation. In this case, I opted to use a bubble condenser instead of the typical Liebig condenser. The bubble condenser has a more efficient cooling of vapor from the increased surface area of the bubbles. To get things started, I turned on the heat and just stepped away. The starting temperature, like it says on the thermometer at the bottom of the screen, was about 20.9 degrees Celsius. After a few minutes, some liquid began to condense on the sides of the flask at about 30C, along with some flashes of gas. 
This is presumably water condensing and gases escaping from the solution. Just as the solution reached 60 C, the temperature quickly began to rise and vapor began condensing within the bubble condenser by 99.5 C. As the liquid condensed, you can see that it collected slowly within each bubble. Then, as the volume within the bubble exceeded the capacity, it fell down to the next until it ultimately ends up in the receiving adapter. These first drops started coming over at about 99.5 C. The distillation continued at this temperature for quite a while and was very well behaved as compared to last time. Obviously, the improvements I made in the methods were working much better. Soon enough, the temperature began to rise past 102 C, so I decided to switch out the receiving adapter. Past this temperature should distill over dilute phosphoric acid, which is useful in some experiments. The temperature increased to 117 C over the course of about 45 minutes, and the distilling solution progressively became darker and darker. At 117 C, you can see a thick smoke beginning to form over the phosphoric acid. Although the acid does not theoretically degrade before 215 C, I suspect some degradation was occurring. At 120 C, the boiling and reflux slowed down quite drastically, so I turned the heat all the way up to push the temperature past the 158 C needed to distill the acid. At this point, most of the water was driven off, which meant phosphoric acid was left in the distilling flask. However, without water, the phosphoric acid could begin esterifying and polymerizing into the pyro and polyphosphoric forms. The temperature then stagnated at about 127 C. This was in part due to the large volume of flask used, with only a small volume of liquid left. To insulate it some to hopefully reach the increased temperature, I wrapped the distilling flask and temperature adapter in aluminum foil. After wrapping, the temperature began to rise again slowly, and some more liquid was coming over into the condenser. However, the rate of increase was so slow, I decided to allow the apparatus to cool and change my setup a bit. Interestingly enough, when I took it off heating, the entire distilling flask filled with a thick smoke. I'm not entirely sure what caused this, because phosphoric acid derivatives tend not to be light sensitive to my knowledge. Once cooled to room temperature, I explored the distilling flask. Like the first time I performed this distillation, there was a large amount of solids stuck at the bottom of the flask. I suspect these may be polyphosphoric acid derivatives of a larger chain that attached to the glass. I transferred over the liquid to a smaller, flat distilling flask for a hot plate distillation. The normal green color returned, and you can see that it is a nice, viscous liquid characteristic of phosphoric acid. This is what the getup looked like after being put together. The only changes from the previous setup are the smaller, flat bottom flask and the hot plate added on the left. After about half an hour, the temperature came back up to about 129C with a small amount of liquid condensing. I turned the hot plate on its highest setting at this point, which will prove to be a huge mistake pretty quickly. Once the temperature reached near 154 C, I started to get excited because we were close to the boiling point of phosphoric acid, but the apparatus started to smoke from underneath the foil wrap. I had entirely covered the temperature head as well as the plastic keck clamp with the foil. The high temperature caused the clamp to melt and started decomposing right on the hot glass. After a little while, I got the glass cleaned up and began heating again. Soon later, the temperature reached 160 C, which is beyond the temperature required to boil phosphoric acid. At this point, I should have realized something wasn't right and removed the heating, but I was determined to get a decently concentrated product, so I kept heating. The temperature continued to rise through 185 C. Here, I started to notice a very small amount of liquid condensing just before the condenser. I suspected that this was some incredibly stubborn phosphoric acid coming over at last. The temperature rose to above 190 C, 200 C, and 210 C before I decided to look up if this distillation was even physically possible. At that point I realized, like I said before, distillation of phosphoric acid is incredibly difficult if not nearly impossible. This is why, of course, chemists set out to find the resins, chelating agents, etc. 
to separate metal ions from the acid. So I turned off the heating and let everything cool. When I took off the aluminum foil wrapping, I was left with this not so pretty sight. It turns out that phosphoric acid etches glass at temperatures above 200 degrees C and eventually coats it in a layer of silicon phosphate on the glass surface. The situation here was even worse though, because some of the melted Keck clamp plastic found its way into the ground glass joint and solidified. The black substance left over would not melt, regardless of the heat I applied, so I had to break the flask open. Here's what was left inside the distilling flask, a goopy material that dissolved and evolved gas in sodium hydroxide solution. The substance must have been a mix of pyro and polyphosphoric acids, formed at those high temperatures. Of course, it was contaminated with the chromium salts, giving the green color. After disposing of the contents in the distilling flask, here are the collected distillates from each separate run. The first flask contains everything before 102 C, the second contains everything from 103 C to 135 C, before I switched the apparatus setup. The final flask contains liquid that was left in the bubble condenser after stopping the distillation, which was drained into the flask by tipping the condenser. Note that the third flask seems more oily than the previous two, meaning there may be a higher concentration in this flask. A pH test showed that the latter two runs produce very acidic solutions, while the former had a neutral pH. This means the first contains only water, but the second two runs contain phosphoric acid. I found the density of the second two solutions just like in the previous video, and plugged the values with the temperatures into the same website. The solution on the left had a concentration of 4.04% phosphoric acid. This value is actually less than the starting dilute phosphoric acid added to this batch. While the first solution was disappointing, the second had a concentration of 56.7%. So at long last, I managed to distill over relatively concentrated phosphoric acid. At the end of this entire process, I collected less than 5 milliliters of this concentrated and slightly yellow acid, which is pretty terrible. However, because distillation of phosphoric acid is nearly impossible, I consider this a success. A small one for sure, but a success nonetheless. Here's a list of some upcoming projects that I have planned. At the time of editing this video, I have ordered some actual concentrated phosphoric acid to use in the future because the amount that I have here is laughable at this point. This entire phosphoric acid project has been a long ride, but at least you got to see some of the trial and error that goes into making even simple chemistry projects like this. If you feel like supporting more chemistry videos like these, feel free to visit my Patreon and support me there. As always, thank you for watching.